So it's our fourth message in the series of uh, Revelations. And uh, again, I don't know what's happening on YouTube, but it's so many people are going to, to YouTube. I think in one week we have 600 uh, hits on YouTube. It's like uh, we're having a YouTube revival. Uh, wow, that's great. It's very encouraging. Very, very encouraging. So we want to welcome you who are watching our videos uh, online and, you know, be with us. Hallelujah. Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Why has Jesus Christ chosen to give this series of visions to John at this time? You know, John introduced himself and how he received these visions, and he says, I, John, so there's no questions about the writer, I am your brother, I am your partner, we share something in common, and that's for all Christians, from all generations, we share as partners in the tribulations, troubles that all Christians will have to face. The kingdom of God, we're part of something so wonderful that will never end. And the patience of Jesus Christ. And the word patience here, that's what we are going to look at this morning. Patience, endurance, perseverance is our theme this morning. So. Revelation, a call to persevere for all generation until Jesus comes again. So John says that in these introductions that patience or perseverance is part of being in Jesus. If you are a Christian, you, you need that. Yeah, you, you cannot walk aside of it. It's going to be for you. Patience, perseverance, and endurance. It's part of being in Jesus for all those who belong to Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. It's part of a message of the church in Ephesians. We will see this morning that the book of Revelation uh, often talks about perseverance and endurance and patience. Depending on which Bible version you, you have, these words are being interchanged. But basically they are using one of these words in Greek, but they are translated in different Bible uh, translations by either of these three words. Revelation chapter 2 verse 2. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3, and you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Each of the seven churches that we find in chapter 2 and 3 of uh, Revelations are so different in states. They are so different. And because of that, the message that Christ gives them can be uh, useful can be suitable to every church in the world and every generation because part of the message to that church applies to us. Part of the message to this other church applies to us. So talking about the, this, this part of the message, we're not going to do a study of the churches this morning. We'll keep it for another time. But just like the part about the perseverance and that we, we find in this text. Jesus, we find a picture of him in the introduction of Revelation. He's in heaven. He's in pure glory by the description that we find. But at the same time, he walks in the midst of his churches on earth. So that's a vision. The vision does that. It's like a dream. Eh? Sometimes you find yourself in your dreams and all sorts of you know, things that you, you very hard to imagine. And uh, it amazes us. But this is a vision in Christ is in heaven, but he walks among his churches on earth. And he observes their state. Each one of them, he knows what is wrong with them. He knows what they need exactly, where they are located. It doesn't matter. He knows and he knows and he knows. So the church of Ephesians is commended for this diligence and duty. This is a good church. This is a great church. Christ keeps an account of every one of your works. That's what he says. I know your works. 
Okay? Does he know what you've been doing for the church? Does he know what you are sacrificing? Does he know like anything that you are doing as a son of God, as a child of God? He knows every single thing. And corporately, as a church, our visions, our missions, our projects, our, our, the, the way we are uh, made up, you know, the, the, how we are made up of different people, of different, we are unique. Lighthouse is a unique church. Say amen. amen. And it's good. We have so many qualities. And it's, it's a great church. I'm so blessed to be part of that church here. When I go outside, I like and sometimes I envy some of the qualities of other churches. But some things is not to my likings. And I, I says, I like Lighthouse style, you know. So whatever we are, it's good. Okay? Whatever we are, God knows. And he knows exactly. He knows how we do things here, you know, and how we labor. He knows our mission trip to the Philippines. He knows our, our adventures in China. He knows every single thing, and he commends us for that. So whatever you do, whatever you do as work, as child of God, or part of this uh, corporate church, he knows that, okay? And he, he rejoices over that. It's, he commands us for that. That's good. Don't stop. Never gets discouraged about that. But it's not enough. We do some things. It's, it's a good thing to be active and to show up to church. Already just showing up to church is a great thing. And like I said last week, and show up on time, it's even better. <laughs> so, but, you know, it, it's good. It's, everything is good. But it's not right enough just to show up, to be on time, to do the right thing, shake the hands, sing the songs. There's something more in our relationship to Jesus Christ. And like if you look at the second uh, part of the verse in uh, ESV, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sakes, and you have not grown weary. Here you use, see another word, patient endurance, which is very correct. It's a very good way to, to, to present this word. And I have a slide to give a definition before we go on, on patience and perseverance and endurance. And you have it or just behind me, so follow with me. Patience in the sense of long sufferings, a quality of self-restraint facing provocation, which does not hastily retaliate. It's the opposite of anger, is associated with mercy. All of us, we find ourselves in situation like this. We, are, we have to self-restrain, self-control. I should not speak up what's on my mind because I could hurt or attack someone else or, or destroy a relationship, do something that I will regret later. So I need to self-restrain. Even though there is an open provocation, there's a situation of unfairness, injustice, or persecutions, or a direct attack against me, or a great level of disappointment, like in a marriage relationship, or in a business office, or something like this. Something's not right, something's not fair, I'm not being treated fair. So I'm being patient. Zip. I'm not speaking. I can control my emotions. I may be boiling inside, but I'm not showing it outside. Okay? We know that, eh? We know we are all emotional people here. Eh? Hallelujah. I'm just thinking of some Facebook post that I have seen not too long ago. So anyway, I'm not going to talk about this. Don't worry. Patient endurance. This word suggests more than only tolerating a circumstance. This is not good. If, if it's only to, to tolerate, see nothing, solve nothing, resolve nothing, that's not what being patient or persevering in the book of Revelation means. Just to be passive and just enduring, you know. It's, it's not only that, okay? So in that sense, the church in Ephesians was rock solid. It was a good church. Perseverance. Steady persistence in a course of actions or in belief. For us, it's really belief in a course of actions. What we believe uh, lead us into actions. We are motivated to, to do certain things for Christ. So we, we steadily 
persist, we persevere. In spite, that's where pers perseverance is important, in spite of opposition, in spite of troubles, of difficulties, obstacles, and even when we feel discouraged and it's not going to work, is it worth it or whatever. Endurance, the ability or strength to continue, especially in spite of fatigue, stress or other adverse conditions, the ability to bear pains, to go on, even if it's cost, like a martyr, you know, when you confess your face and you are being rejected, you take a stand and it's going to hurt you. The contract is not going to you because you're not corrupt uh, enough, you know, you don't accept a bribe. It's going to cost, but that's what we, we, are, we are able to bear the pains, the loss, because we, we can endure in the name of Christ. That's a quality that does not give up or does, does not capitulate under trial, suffering, or negative circumstance. It's the opposite of hopelessness. We're not hopeless. We're not alone. We're not helpless. There's hope. There's assurance. There's something that keeps us going. That's what we're talking about in the book of Revelation. Amen? Amen. In the King James, they use the term, you have born. There's something that you bear on your shoulder. You have born, endured, sustained. You receive afflictions, reproaches, persecutions, but you can bear these things, okay? Uh, there are many pressures. If we are going to be a church in Lighthouse, we have been existing for at least 22 years. We have been through different situations of pressures in the past. And as a Christian church, to maintain uh, unity, to maintain doctrinal purity, to maintain our identity as a church, as Lighthouse, based on the foundations with which we, we were established, to maintain these things, to protect and preserve these things, going to cost. It needs perseverance. If we are here today, 22 years later, it's because there were perseverance. And for many of you, you were here at the beginning, so you have persevered. Amen? Amen. So slap yourself in the shoulder. Say, good job if you've been here from the beginning of Lighthouse. You're still here. Slap yourself on the shoulder. But the question is, is that enough? Is that enough? Like, uh, you slap yourself on the shoulder because you're still here. Is that really enough? Is that the, 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 the standards to measure, you know, your relationship with Jesus? Maybe not. But anyway, that's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about perseverance. So slap yourself on the shoulder. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, You have born for my name's sake. So for Jesus' name, in the, the King James, you have born. You, you, you accepted because of your identity as a Christian. But at the same time, in verse 2 it says, but you couldn't bear those who are evil. So that's a nice contrast. Certain things you refuse to bear, you cannot accept. Uh, hypocrisy, uh, false teaching, but you can bear, you know, the, 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 the cost to be a Christian. Some things you can bear. So that's a nice, nice contrast. Amen. Mr. Spurgeon says, talking about the church there and the fact that they could bear for his name's sake, but they could not bear false teaching. Mr. Spurgeon has this to say. This was grand of them. This is a commendable. It showed a backbone of truth. They're solid. They're strong. I wish some of the churches of this age had a little of this holy decision about them. For nowadays, if a man be clever, he may preach the vilest lie that was ever vomited from the mouth of hell, and it will go down with some. So it's a commendation to the church of Ephesians to keep and retain that purity of doctrines because it seems that it's been lost in some churches around the world. They showed godly perseverance, and we should imitate that. If you look at the outward appearance of the church of Ephesians, this was a solid church. Amen? Do you agree with me? You look at them. I know your work. I know your faithfulness, your perseverance, what you've done. This is a solid church. They had great outreach. They worked hard. They protected the integrity of the gospel. That's all commendable. And it looks a lot like Lighthouse to me. Like just these three qualities. A church that worked hard. A church that has great outreach. Amen? and protect the integrity of the gospel. These are three qualities of Lighthouse for sure. Amen? Amen. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's great. But is it enough? Is it enough to be like this? Okay. The Ephesian Christian paid the price. They were steadfast and they were going on when the going was tough. But there's a warning that comes with it that can happen to all of us Christians. They serve Jesus faithfully. They can pat themselves on the shoulders. They've been there all along for so many years and they've been paying their tithes and they've been, you know, persevering with the rest of the congregation. They toiled. They are engaged uh, in service. They have persevered for years. But they may have ended up doing all of this and at the end losing their first love. It's possible to be right. It's possible to be there. It's possible to be persevering. It's possible to be loyal, to uh, participate to the church meetings and to be on time. It is possible to do a different task in the church, to be a teacher, or even a pastor. It is possible to do all of these things that are really commendable and that makes a great church you know, distinct but at the same time missing on the most important. So this is something that we all need to check this morning. Lighthouse is a great church. Lighthouse has these qualities that I just mentioned, but is it possible that in some of us we have lost our emotions? That we have lost the motives? And the reasons why we should be faithful and persevering and everything. The motives is more important than the action itself. The heart is more important than the action. So I just want to challenge this morning. Be warned that we are a good church. And I agree and I support that. And that we are going in the right directions. But individually, please do check your heart. Why? Have you lost your emotions? Have you lost your emotions that you have been having? Your, your dreams, your excitements, your, your desires, you know, uh, your, your freedom, your freedom. Or have you become a, a bit cynic or uh, critical or judgmental or colder or, you know, like you, you are there, but so what, you know? I don't agree with this. I don't agree with that. I think no, 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 I'm not, not doing that. Not raising my hands. And I'm not. No, 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 no. <laughs> it, it is possible that we go through time, tough times. And sometimes it, it's just like in a marriage relationship. We may be disappointed with people, with the pastors, with the decisions, with different things. I knew a friend of mine. We were playing music years ago in our, in our uh, Christian groups. And at one point, he, he, he grew up and he matured. And he was elected to be a deacon in the church. And he lost his faith being a deacon. He could not handle the disagreement. He wanted to be right. And nobody made him right. He wanted his ideas to be accepted. And they were not. And, and he, he got hurt. And he turned his back. And he is playing music still today in the world. I've been just uh, befriending him on Facebook uh, just recently. It's a very close friend. Being a deacon involved in the church with the r r r probably the, the, the right desire at first, but he, he, this contributed to losing and turning back. So this is important. We may be here. We may be here active. We may be here looking great and doing a lot of good, good, commendable things. But let us be warned this morning that it might be that we are still doing that, but we have lost our emotions. And it should not be. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 19, the church in Thyatira, uh, I know your works, love, service, faith, and patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. That's again a great church, commendable. They have four qualities that are essential to a church. They have love both for the Lord and for one another. This is wonderful. They knew how to minister and their faith and patience are highlighted. 
What do you want more than that, you know? And this one, they were from Thyatara, and apparently Thyatara was one of the very insignificant, the least significant city of the seven churches of Revelation. And the one point for us is that Jesus Christ, as he said to all of the churches, I know your works. Whether you come from a big successful churches, a mega church in California, or you come from a small barangays in some of province, mountainous province of the Philippines, I know your works. And he knows that. And he knows everything. He knows everything. Why do Christians need perseverance and endurance? The word in Greek means, it comes from two, two words, like a prefix and another part of the word, under and to remain. That is the word exactly that we're talking about. I remain under. I remain under the circumstance. I remain under this difficult situation. I remain under the cost to pay to be a Christian as long as it will take. I remain under for the name of Jesus Christ. A, remain, a remaining under or an endurance in hard circumstances. It's a form of courage. You know, we all admire courage. I mean, the, you, you look at somebody, you hear a story of courage in the headlines, you, you just, it just makes you feel great about humanity or something. And it makes even you, it makes, anyway, for me, it makes me desire to be uh, courageous and to do something like for society or whatever that would be uh, uh, reminded, okay, oh, this man is a courageous man. You know, like we have this, this is very important. So this uh, remaining under as something about courage, about bravery. And we need perseverance so that we can properly uh, run the race. Uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, you know that part of the verse, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. This is a disciplinary term that we find here. Look at how the athletes, we look at the beauty, you know, synchronism, the synchronism of swimming, or, you know, artistic uh, skating, or uh, diving, you know. Uh, you look at these tremendous athletes and, you know, it looks so easy. I dare you to try to do it. Go on the 10 meter, uh, you know, step and try to do the, the double flip, you know, backwards and see what happened to you, okay. <laughs> So, this is a disciplinary uh, a term that is, you know, another reason why we need perseverance, it is to be an ongoing characteristic in our life. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 and 36, uh, looks back on the history of these new believers that are not new anymore, and, at the, the, and the, the writer reminds them, recall the former days when after you were enlightened, what happened? You endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Their possessions were taken, they were put in prison, they were isolated, they were beaten. A lot of difficult things happened to them. But remember, when you were enlightened, you were so excited about your faith that you could bear under. You were willing to look at everything that you suffered. But now, years later, they need to continue to do this in verse 36. But you have need of endurance now. So it's not that you have endured and it's past. It's something that is ongoing. We need to be ready and we need to be able, uh, enabled by God's grace to be remaining under at any time that it is called for for us. Amen? Another uh, term that you find in Revelation is found in two <laughs> verses, the same expression, Revelation 13.10 and 14.12. It is called, here is a call for the endurance of the saints. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints. And the context of these two verses uh, points out into the time of the tribulations where people will have to suffer a great price for that. But at the same time, uh, these people have this call to endure. And even though this text points to the Great Tribulation, the principle remains 
for us who are not going to be uh, in the tribulations. But at any time, there is a call for perseverance presented to us when we face situations, when we face situations or hard situations where we have to endure patiently. It's a call for us. When we face choice to obey God and refuse to compromise or lower our standards, it's a call to persevere. When we uh, stand boldly for our faith, and, and we choose to, instead of being ashamed of the gospel and become an anonymous uh, Christian, it's a call. It's a call to persevere. It's an encouragement uh, in the light of the coming uh, judgment. Those, the context is that those who do not patiently endure, but gives, gives in to the pressures of society, will have to face God's wrath. That's the, the, the picture that is understood in these uh, two scriptures and the context, but not us, because we are called to suffer now, endure now, so that we will avoid this one. How does endurance grow? Why is endurance necessary? Endurance, according to the Bible, grows through trials. It's a testing. It's a testing. James 1, verse 3 and 4. For you know what, that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Everyone's first reactions to difficulties is, I want to get out of it. I want to escape any things. That's the normal, natural situation. That's normal. It's, you are not abnormal when you want to escape. You are very, very normal. But uh, James commands the believers to let that remainder, reminder under, to, 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 to remain under the circumstance, to, to let it do its work. Because when you accept it, that you are tested. You see, when believers encounter trials, we should not be dismayed because we see this. there's a partnership. We will all go through these kind of things. But there is a, a purpose into that. It is a test of our faith. That's what James is telling us. There's a test of our faith. And because we know, we understand that, you read the scriptures, you've read this text, you understand that when you're going through a hard time, it's testing your faith. Because you understand that, it gives you a reason to accept to remain under the circumstances victoriously, to persevere, and let it run its course, and let it develop whatever it's going to develop in you that is so um, important into our lives. This is a work of development, like a, pro a process in you, and it is to bring the believers to completeness, to maturity. Isn't that beautiful? That's what Jesus is working. As we remain under, we are being developed to maturity. And that's what Jesus, it is necessary. It is a necessary process in our faith. You and I, we need to become like Jesus. You and I, we need to become mature. Amen? And this testing, when we accept it and we stay under that, we can become. Another point is also grow your character and bring hope. In Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4, we can rejoice too, even when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. Okay, again, problems and trials. It's kind of depressive message, isn't it? <laughs> it helps us to develop endurance. I'm sorry to, to preach that to you, but, you know, it's part of the Bible, and it's, it is necessary to develop some qualities that are essential to our development. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. The word Paul uses for problem here is, if you look in the Greek, you will see stress and pressure. This is the problems. How many of you know what stress is? How many of you know what pressure is, you know? I know that many of you are at work here in Hong Kong. You are always stressed and always under pressure. So it represents, you know, very well, very, uh, us very well. We know stressful situations. 
And we know that they are working out endurance because we decide to trust in the Lord nevertheless and to remain under, to persevere. God supplies grace and our character is being worked out. I want to talk about character. The Greek word for character this morning is quite interesting. The Greek word for character, some Bible use the different word in the Bible translation, but the word here means to approve of something after testing. That's, I don't know why they, they, they translated character, but the, the Greek idea is to approve of something after testing. I think the King James used the word experience, produce experience, I think if I'm not uh, mistaken. So you, you decide to endure and it develops something that after you've been tested by going through this tough time, you are being approved. Isn't that great? God will approve what you have become because you accepted to remain under and to persevere. That you wanted to. You wanted to trust in the Lord. You, you made the choice, the decision to stay there and persevere whatever happens, to continue on, to bear a situation, and you have become a person of character that is acceptable to God, that is approved by God. You have become a more noble person, a more beautiful person, a person accepted by God. That's what I want to become. Amen? Amen. Can you say that of yourself? Yes. Tell your neighbor, I want to become a more noble person. Amen. Someone said it like this, and I think it's a, it's, a, it's a nice way to put it. When God sees us bearing up under our trials and looking to Him to work out His purpose through these trials, God awards us with His good endurance seal of approval. He gives you like a medal, like a, a seal of approval, stamped. You pass the test. Good job. He just gives you uh, his seals of approval. And, and you know, you have a conscience. You know yourself. You know when you do something wrong and you feel bad about yourself and you feel a bit uh, dis disconnection with God. You, you know that. You can feel that. But at the same time, you can also realize when you did something good. You, you feel proud of yourself because you feel that God is proud of you. You, you feel that he approves of your jest or you've been brave for God. You stood for the Lord. You refused to sin. You made a decision for God. You feel the pleasure of God. Amen? Amen. Tell me that it is true. Yes, it is true. So because of that, you feel good and it produces hope. That's what it says. It, this endurance gives character, this uh, being approved, a, a proven character, and then it creates hope. But again, the word hope is also an interesting word in this text. You know, all the words in the Bible is so filled with meaning, and this word hope, you know sometimes it says, I hope tomorrow is Friday. <laughs> uh, but it's not going to happen on Friday because it's only a wish. Okay, hope in the sense of a wish. But here the hope we're talking about is not like a wish. It's an assurance. This hope is an assurance that what I hope for is going to be given to me. That is what it produces. So you see the work, the work of trials, what's done? It has transformed me on a more beautiful person, acceptable, proven, tested, and it has given me an assurance with God and an assurance and what's coming ahead. Amen? Amen? So I am so, so excited about that this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. So this hope or this assurance impacts our attitude toward the future. Are you excited about the future or are you afraid of the future? You know, there, 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 sometimes we, we are afraid of the future. Look at the headlines. You will be afraid of the future, you know. Or look at all the, the many people, they told me they are afraid of the book of Revelation because it's scary. Horrible things going to happen on earth. Well, why should we be afraid of that when we're not going to be there? 
Amen? I'm not going to be there. I'm going up. I'm going up. I'll be with the Lord. Because I accept now to stay under. Whatever comes my way, I know God is working, is preparing me. And when the trumpet blows and the rapture comes, I'm going to be part of that. Amen? Amen. So I'm not concerned and not afraid of what happens. It's only to make you uh, know ahead, hey, don't stay there. Do everything I say so that you will be gone. It, it gives you a, a look of that to appreciate and to give you reason to praise the Lord so that you are not going to be in the wrath of God when it comes. You are not going to be judged. You are not going to be part of that. You are going to be taken in the rapture. That's the hope. That's the assurance that I have because I, I accept you know, the, to, to persevere. I accept to endure and to continue. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord. My two last scriptures, I'm skipping a little bit. Uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 7, and 22, verse 7. Two expressions that are associated with perseverance. He who, who overcomes. That's perseverance right there. He who overcomes. In order to overcome, you need to endure, you need to persevere, you need to... And it gives us also an, another, pay, another idea, it, it enlarges our meaning of what perseverance is. Because when it says, he who overcomes, it, it makes us think that patience is not passive or negative. It, as we said previously, it's more than tolerating and waiting and just being passive when the situation is happening to us. It's not passive or negative. Overcoming talks about victory. Overcoming talks about action. Overcoming talks about hope. Overcoming is, a, is, is, is something that is willing, determined, something that finds a, a, a solution. And revelation uh, patience or uh, endurance is associated with victories that involves actions. It is associated with hearing what the Spirit says. Ah, oh, that's part of enduring as well. That means that here I am facing a problem. Pa passive is just enduring, doing nothing. But active, overcoming patience like, Lord, what are you saying to me? Lord, I want to understand this situation, this problem. Am I part of the problem? Have I caused this problem? How can I solve this problem? Lord, guide me into this whole process. He who hears the Spirit. If you hear the Spirit, you will get an understanding of this problem at some point, and, and as maybe you will become part of the solution of that uh, situation. It is also... Um, a realization. It is also a returning to the life that pleases God. It is also a keeping the words of prophecy. This is also strong because you keep, you refuse to abandon. This talks of discipline. This talks of strength of character. This talks of determination. I'm a Christian. The Word of God is important to me. It feeds my hope. It feeds my desire for God. I'm not letting down my guard. I'm not letting the values of this world replace it. I'm not letting the hobbies, the activities of the world becoming more important so that I, I'm not focusing on the Word of God. He who keeps the words. And to keep this, you need to be strong. You need to fight against the enemy because the enemy will want to, really you to lose out, to miss out, to abandon and everything. That's really something that the enemy will want to do. You know, Satan will do everything he can to make every circumstance of your life so miserable, difficult, that you will feel bad about yourself, that you will feel it's not worth it. He will confuse you. He will make you see this too hard. He will make you believe that you cannot make it, that you are unworthy, you know. And it's all to discourage you to endure. If Satan can stop you from enduring, he wins. That's all he has to do to, to discourage you, to, to, to refuse to persevere, to refuse to be victorious, to refuse to do another fight. 
And the thing with Satan is not that it is one fight. You want a fight? There will be another one. Then there is another one. Then there is another one. Then there is another one. And perseverance must continue. It's an ongoing thing. If he just can make you quit. You know how sad it is. These people who trained for a marathon, let's say the Boston Marathon, which is one of the famous ones, or the New York Marathon, and they, they run and they run and they <coughs> collapse just before they get at the end. This is so sad. You know, it's a defeat. But we are not to, to quit. It doesn't matter which uh, number you, you get to the finish line, but finish your line. Finish it, and you will have a reward. That's the living hope that we have in Christ Jesus. You know, think about marriage. Every marriage, a Christian life like a marriage life. And it may be some advice for the single here in the room. <laughs> and the married people as well, okay? Pastor Jennifer seems so... Disturbed by my word at this time. <laughs> Every marriage has its rough spot. And then, Pastor Jennifer will say, yes, you know, that's why I'm single. I prefer the single <laughs> life. I don't want the rough spot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Every marriage has its tough spot. Tension and relationship, financial stress, uh, over commitment, you know, too many activities, like you get bugged in and all sorts of things, work, uh, children's activities, sports, pressure with children, rebellion, everything. And this will always do one thing, it will weaken your level of satisfaction, your level of uh, romantic satisfaction, your feeling of love will go down the drain when, it, when you go through that. It will lead to disappointment and very negative emotions. If it is handled wrongly, there will be words of anger, there will be hurtful words, and there will be resentment and broken hearts. Is there hope for such a marriage? Yes, there is. Passive patience will lead to more disappointment. You know, if you are in a bad marriage, and you just w bear it and do nothing, it's not going to change, isn't it? At the same time, you don't want to go nagging. Huh? <laughs> so, you need the perseverance we're talking about, the bearing under that is active, the listening to the Holy Spirit says, that will lead to actions, the determinations to make this marriage w work, the hope, the hope that it can change, the assurance that God can intervene, and, uh, and then you will get something. Endurance and perseverance will make it work. If you quit on your marriage, it's going to die. If you endure and you persevere, you will r raise it from the dead, and it will work. Amen? Amen. When I do marriage seminar, there's always a chart that I like to, to show to, to people. It's like a chart. I showed it years ago here in the church. It's a chart about the level of set, uh, romantic satisfactions for couples. High and low and medium, and then the stages of life. You know, when you, get, uh, when you uh, court each other, of course, it's very high. Eh? The satisfaction is very high. Then when baby comes, and then when the children go to, to school, and then uh, they become teenagers, like you, you go on on the chart like that, and then you see that the curve is going down. It's going down, it's going down, it's going down. When's going to stop going down? You know? And then when they go to university, they leave home. Whoops, getting up. Let's go up, let's go up. And then aging, it's very high. It's very high, just like in the courting. That's where I am right now. <laughs> I'm very high. I am very, very high. Amen? <laughs> Same thing with Jesus Christ. Amen? Same thing with Jesus Christ. It may go down because you're, you're in tough spots, but persevere. It's going up, and you're going to be in your best spot. Amen? Yeah. Jesus Christ is coming soon. That's why we have the book of Revelation. It's telling us right in your face, I'm coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. Hello, hello. Are you? And then it says, behold. Behold. You remember when I said behold last week? Behold. Hey, look, listen, pay attention. Behold, I'm coming quickly. What does that mean? coming quickly means, uh, you know, be awake. I'm coming quickly. Amen. Hallelujah. 
this message is addressed to the church today. I told you last year, after I went to Canada, when I came back here, uh, after talking with my mom, she was sharing with me how many elderly Catholic are questioning the truth of what they have been taught. You know, they have been taught about heaven. After that, there is heaven. But they don't believe it anymore. They cannot believe it anymore. They are just disappointed with the church and they cannot, they are not believing it. They read the Dalai Lama story. That's what they like to read or whatever it is. But they are not reading the Bible. They don't know about the Bible. And now they, they, there are so many scandals in the church that they are, you know, discouraged. They, they cannot believe it anymore. That's what happened. I was talking with someone in, in Canada recently talking about, and, 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 and I'm addressing an uh, age group in this church here, the age group 35-45, so about something like 40 or something like that, about the midlife crisis for Christian. Midlife crisis is not only for in, in the world. Whatever happened, there's something special. You know, we often talk about uh, uh, teenage years, uh, the crisis, teenage years. Did you, did you realize that there is a second phase to that? And I'm serious about it. There is something that truly exists that is called a midlife crisis. And it is human, it is in the hormones, it is physical, it is emotional, it is spiritual, and it exists and it's very real and it is affecting Christian and non-Christian alike. So you better be careful about that. And the conversation that I was having is that people that I have known, that have been in our Christian schools, who are now couples getting to the age of what I mentioned, are having conversation among themselves, and they are saying with their own lips, this is not my values anymore. I'm not sure if I believe it anymore. This is what they're saying. They are Christian, they are still going to church, but they are talking among themselves about their faith, about the Bible, about the church, and they are not speaking positively at all. And they even accuse their parents, like our generation, that we were too extremes in the way that we raised them to go to church and all of this and get them to, to pray and you know get involved in church. They are accusing us that we were too extremes and uh, they, they, they are talking like this. And th in that conversation, the person I was talking with was telling me, you know, it really scares me because I am going myself into that same age group and I am listening to uh, what they are saying. You know what happened? They miss out. They are still in church, and we're talking about uh, the, the church of uh, Revelation chapter 2. They are still in church, and they are still involved. I, I know one of them. He's playing the music in church, and his wife says, these are not my values anymore. He's still playing the music, still a worship leader, but he's, he, he's going to church with that, that mind, that, that mindset of doubting, and you know, it's not worth it, and our parents. And one more thing, this says, we have been stolen years of our life because we parents brought them to church and got them to get involved in all of these Christian activities. We are being accused of having been too extremes and of having now they, they, they feel like they have wasted these years where we were taking them to, to church. Wow. It's very disappointing to hear that. But this is where we are. So if you are in that age group and you are going through, you have lost your emotions, you better check for yourself. Because without your emotions in Christ Jesus, what do you have? Without that living hope that we were describing this morning, this assurance, if you lose out, these people are still in the church, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they are not reading their Bibles anymore. They are reading all sorts of other things. They are having all sorts of other activities. They are going to have a, a social drinks instead, you know, of attending a small group's Bible studies. They are having a great time in the world. They are being prosperous. They are making money now. They are to that age where they, they, they are successful. They, they can pay the bills. They have their homes. They have their cars. You know, they, they, everything is working fine with them. But in the area of faith, 
they are losing out on that and they are very disappointed about that. So it made, made me think, why is the book of Revelation so important? It is important for that reason. He who keeps the words of the prophecy is blessed. Are you keeping it? Are you victorious? Are you enduring? This book is for you. This book is for this generation. This book is for your salvation. This book is a call to persevere. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.